66 million years ago, the sky fell. A mountain of fire and stone crashed into the earth with a force beyond imagining. In an instant, the age of the dinosaurs ended. But in this world, the impact did more than destroy. It awakened something ancient, the magical weave that binds every reality, memoriam. Invisible, unfathomable, and brimming with power, it flooded through the wounded earth, and in its wake, life began to change, to twist, to evolve in new ways no world had ever seen before. We have now reached the period between 17 to 14 million years ago. Earth has entered a natural greenhouse phase, the mid-Miocene climatic optimum, and global temperatures have climbed 3 to 6 degrees above the modern levels. Polar ice nearly vanished, and CO2 rose to 400 to 600 parts per million, numbers uncomfortably close to that of today's. This wasn't a brief spike even. For millions of years, warmth reshaped the planet, forests crept into high latitudes, subtropical zones expanded, and warmer seas drove major shifts in marine ecosystems. Meanwhile, the slow grind of tectonics, the rising Himalayas, the closing of seaways, was rewriting Earth's climatic systems, altering ocean currents, intensifying monsoons, and changing how carbon flowed through the air, land, and sea. During the mid-Miocene climatic optimum, Africa sat much where it does today, but the continent was far from still. The East African Rift was beginning to split the land, raising volcanic highlands and carving a patchwork of valleys, lakes and uplands that shaped local climates and ecosystems. This tectonic restlessness altered river systems and created a mosaic of habitats. The climate was far wetter than today's. Dense rainforests spread across Central and West Africa, while the East hosted broad belts of savanna woodland. A powerful monsoon system fed by the warm Indian Ocean currents brought seasonal rains that sustained these rich landscapes. Large geoliths inhabited the arid landscapes. In the Sahara, the sand snooters continued to develop, becoming a Sinus deserti, or the desert hogs. These creatures became more adept at sifting through sand for edible material and biota, their faces shortening, nasal cavities growing larger. Though the most interesting features about these creatures is their unique defense capabilities. When threatened, desert hogs will form a ring around their young, facing out and beginning to blast abrasive clouds of sand at any would-be attacker. They seem to exhibit some form of strategic intelligence, as they alternate blasts with the beast next to them to maintain a constant barrage against predators. Individuals descended from a clade of seismically proficient proboscideans have begun to weaponize their vocalizations, managing to amplify their own sounds using their larger, hollow tusks. Capable of reaching 230 decibels, more than enough to stun predators, and in some cases, even maiming them permanently. They use their tusks as rasps to communicate through echo clicks that reverberate through their vibrating chambers within their tusks. These Dinotherium sonarum, or vocafonts, became widely successful, forcing change within the savannah in Africa. Among this world of projectile defences, the great African dragons struggled. Many species died out, though such a wondrous clade would be difficult to remove from the mountains of Africa forever. Two particularly interesting genera sprung from the threat of extinction. The first, Dracosarani, the sand dragons, speciated directly to hunt the large sand hogs, developing spherical valves and upper column over their spiracles to prevent sand from entering their lungs while diving. Additionally, they developed nictitating membranes to protect their sensitive eyes from the abrasive sand bursts. These dragons held no fear from the sandstorms conjured by the hogs, diving headlong into their defensive circles to pluck the vulnerable from the centre of their protective rings. Emerging through the sandstorm, taking their prey to a safe place to dispatch and eat it. The second species of note evolved down the route of ambush, selecting for greater wing size and surface area, reducing the wing beats per second, thus removing the telling butts that would alert especially the incredibly sound sensitive vocafonts. Greater neuromuscular control over their morphing wings allowed these creatures to control their flight kinematics to the point of silently hovering. These dragons hunt by flying to the great heights above the African wilderness, tracking large herds of geolith or other herbivores, before orientating itself with the sun at its back, hovering, hidden by the blinding light behind it. From this tactic, the sun dragon Dracos Solis gained its name. From this obscure vantage point, the dragon selects its prey, 
beginning a swift, silent descent, snatching prey before the herd can react and kick up their defences, be that sound or sand. Anatomically, the sun dragons have developed pseudo joints in their previously stiff wings. Gainder's musculature had stretched along the chitinous length of their wings, began bending them for greater control. While their kin spread into the forests of Europe and became more cautious, ambush oriented wood drakes, some Dromeandros descendants remained in the vast open plains and seasonal floodlands of Africa. There, amidst herds of massive herbivores and thick skinned geoliths, speed alone was no longer enough. These desert drakes, or Dracirus vastilos, entered an evolutionary arms race, not just with their prey, but with other predators vying for dominance. What emerged was a new form, leaner and more powerfully built, and terrifyingly specialised, the raptomorph. These savanna adapted drakes have evolved longer, more muscular hind limbs with tendon locking mechanisms, allowing them to launch themselves high and far capable of bounding over tall grass and slamming sideways into the flanks of large prey. The middle limbs, once used for stability, now end in elongated raptorial claws with reinforced joints, ideal for piercing thick hide and latching onto the sides of their megafauna mid-stride. Their forelimbs have become wickedly curved grapples, used not to kill outright, but to cling and tear while their prey thrashes. Desert drakes coordinate with high-pitched clicking vocalizations and foot drumming to flush or flank out their prey. Their attack strategy is raptor-like, launching onto the haunches or underbellies of prey and dragging with weight and injury until the beast collapses, often due to blood loss or a broken gait. Their skulls are narrower and more reinforced, allowing for powerful side biting, especially to tendons, and their vision remains acute but it's their sense of motion, triggered by subtle shifts in dust, air currents and body heat, that has become razor honed. Chitin is thinned across most of the body, replaced with fibrous scale-like plating that reduces the weight while providing enough protection from kicking hooves and whipping tails. This morph is particularly adept at hunting juvenile geoliths, whose calcification is not yet complete. Packs will harass a herd until one youngling breaks rank and then descend like jackals with wings clipped, Tenacious, precise, and relentless. During the mid Miocene climactic optimum, South America remained an isolated continent, its wildlife evolving along unique and ancient lines. Warm, wet conditions expanded humid, megathermal forests across the proto Amazon, while the rising central and northern Andes created a new mountainous habitat and altered wind and rainfall patterns, even casting emerging rain shadows over parts of the east. With no placental carnivores or hoofed mammals, the land was ruled by marsupial predators like the sporastodonts, large native ungulates such as the notungulates and astropatheas, giant ground sloths and armadillo relatives, and towering flightless terror birds. Among the predators, Thylacus smilus was perhaps the most specialised, a sabre-toothed sporastodont with long downward curving canines and a reinforced skull, converging on the role of true sabre-toothed cats it was likely an ambush hunter, delivering precise killing bites to soft tissue in large prey. Some of the dominant terror birds, those that specialised in the predation of geoliths, continued to grow to extraordinary proportions to match their enlarged and heavily armoured prey. Lithoprimo rex was the largest of these birds. Various adaptations accompanied this increase in size. The skeletal structure adapted significantly developing massive columnar limbs to support their weight and elongated muscular tails to counterbalance their deepening torsos and reinforced skulls. Their beaks evolved into crushing weapons with thickened keratin layers on an internal bone reinforcement, while their abductor mandibular complex grew powerfully robust, allowing them to generate immense bite forces capable of cracking the mineralized dermis of the geoliths they hunted. Their necks thickened, Cervical vertebrae reinforced and visual processing improved to track and strike with deadly precision. Air sac systems expanded throughout their bodies for efficient respiration and thermoregulation, enabling sustained exertion despite their bulk. In both form and function, these birds became pseudo versions of their distant ancestors, the non avian theropods, eventually reaching sizes equivalent to the Displetosaurus, a close relative of Tyrannosaurus rex, approximately 8 to 9 metres long. Largely scooped geoliths, faced with megafaunal threats to which their bulk alone could not withstand, did not stand still evolutionarily. They began to see development of their rostrum, morphing into a large shield-like protrusion, 
able to easily endure the predation attempts of, by smaller predators and even deter the largest of the Lithoprimo terror birds. This enlarged frill structure, in addition to defence, was utilised by the spike-backed scoopers, Folium acutus, to strip trees of bark. Whether this was for an additional food source, marking territory, removing parasites or some other purpose entirely is largely unknown. While size could not defend against the largest predators, it was a significant deterrent, leading to these creatures growing to the size of Kentrosaurus, approximately 6 metres in length. These creatures became one of the most widely successful geoliths in South America. The shell geoliths, the pteracanth, also continued to grow, feeding on the nutrient-rich sediments of the South American coasts and plains, painting a picture of moving mounts across the region, with many shelled megafaunal browsers, both geolith and testudinids, the ancient giant turtles and tortoises. This habitat of mobile terrain, spanning the otherwise sparsely populated scrubland, created interesting niches for other animals, where living among large migrational herds, defended by shelled herbivores and geoliths, became commonplace outside of the large spans of forest and jungle. As the herds of pteracanth and testudinids migrated around the lighter forests of South America, they break down old trees and churn up the ground, leaving healthy grasslands in their wake, which would then regrow within the season before the next passing of the Great Migration. By the mid-Miocene, North America was in the midst of an ecological shift. Forests still covered parts of the continent, but across the central plains, drier conditions and stronger seasonal cycles were driving the spread of grasslands. This change from dense woodland to open country favoured grazing herbivores, long-legged runners and species able to cope with unpredictable resources. Among the emerging grazers was Merichippus, a three-toed horse with a high crown teeth for grinding tough grasses and more efficient limbs for covering long distances. It wasn't yet the single-toed form of modern horses, but it marked a crucial step in their evolution towards life on the open plains. Smaller and more delicate, Stenomylus was a gazelle-like camelid built for speed. Its long legs and light frames suggest it could sprint across arid grasslands, browsing and grazing while staying ahead of predators. Not all mid-Miocene herbivores followed the grassland trend. In wetter floodplains, the shorter-limbed, barrel-bodied Teleoceras thrived. This semi-aquatic rhinoceros, reminiscent of the modern hippo, shows that pockets of lush, water-rich habitats still persisted alongside the growing sea of grass. In a prehistoric North America, dominated by stone-skinned geoliths, evolution delivered a skyborne answer to their armoured dominance, the griffin. Chief among them was Thalornis Teramone, a colossal aerial predator, lifting geoliths into the air and dropping them to shatter their rocky hides. As this threat intensified during the late Eocene, geoliths evolved in divergent ways. Some grew heavier and tougher, while others became faster, smarter and more mobile laying the foundation for the first proto-dwarfs. A second griffin species, Thalornis Tharavex, arose to meet these agile new prey, evolving cooperative hunting and advanced cognition. Over time, the griffin became not only apex predators of the sky, but highly intelligent creatures with memory, strategy and social bonds. Anatomically, griffins possessed a unique wyvern-like body plan that blends powerful flight with quadrupedal agility. Their wings are elongated, Jointed forelimbs reinforced with dense musculature allowing both airborne lift and terrestrial locomotion across broken highlands. Claws on their wing hands aid in climbing and grappling prey, while deep keeled sterna and highly mobile shoulder girdles anchor their explosive launch power. This hybrid anatomy reflects a compromise between flight precision and ground stability, making them equally deadly on the wing and on the rocks below. Shelled geoliths grow to immense proportions, spurred by their aerial predators, aided by the magical properties of the gold they feed upon in the uric-rich alluvium of the North American floodplains. Reaching shell sizes exceeding 5 metres in diameter and weights of 3 to 4 tonnes, these passive tanks, when full grown, are near impenetrable to attacks from most predators. These creatures, known as giants or geolithus titanus, are closely related to dwarves and, while less intelligent, do have social bonds akin to elephants with clear emotional intelligence, even being known to mourn their dead, some even seemingly having rituals, somewhat praying to the moon among other things. These colossi are great beasts of wondrous proportions and culture. 
The earliest dwarven ancestors, stooped, broad-backed creatures known to scholars as Geolithus primivitus, were scavengers and tool users who trailed behind the great shell geoliths, including giants, cracking their dung for trace minerals and sheltering in the empty, sun-baked shells of the dead. These immense gold-infused shells offered not just refuge from the winged reapers of the skies, but a resonant, protective space. Within these protective hollows, early geoliths shaped crude stone implements with their heavy forelimbs, etched spiral patterns into the inner walls with their acidic spit, and practiced the earliest forms of kin bonding rituals, body marking, chipping of dermal plates, and rhythmic hammering that mimicked the heartbeats of the Terracanth themselves, paying homage to the hollowed out giants that became the first hearts of dwarven identity, a fusion of mineral, memory, and survival instinct. All these being undeniable markers for an ancient dwarven culture.